Right. Uh, great to uh, great to be with you all tonight. Um, first of all, just a few disclosures. This is um, related to some of my uh, research work on palpitations and syncope. Um, I've met lots of you before, so uh, um, I'm not going to go into a little bit too much about where I work. But this is Edinburgh. This is not how it looks today. We've not no uh, snow, but it's uh, it's pretty cold. Um, and this is our emergency department uh, where I work as well, a major trauma centre. Um, we see about 120, 130,000 patients a year and have the same uh, problems that uh, that you all have in your emergency departments across the UK. So what we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to talk about palpitations. We're going to talk about what they are. We're going to talk about how to treat them, what the common causes are, um, and what do we do with somebody who we have and we want to know what the underlying cause is. So that's what we're going to spend most of the first half an hour on. And then just at the end, I'm going to touch a little bit on the use of modern technology um, and how um, those people with their Fitbits and Apple Watches and things now are starting to um, appear in the management of these type of conditions. So I'm going to start with the case. This is a, a woman who's 65, who was sitting in an Edinburgh restaurant having uh, afternoon tea with her friend and suddenly develops a sudden onset of palpitations with chest pain in her chest. A friend looks, says she looks really awful. Someone in the restaurant phones an ambulance just before they arrive, her palpitation settles and she starts to settle down. Uh, the uh, ambulance service bring her to the emergency department. So, that's the kind of patient that we're we're talking about. I'm sure you have all seen patients like that um, in your tens and hundreds uh, during your careers. So first of all, we'll talk a little bit about what is palpitation. So this is the, the textbook definition. So it's a feeling of your heart racing, pounding, fluttering, or like you have missed heartbeat. So it's a sensation and everyone talks about palpitations in a different way. So for some people, it might be that the heart was going very fast. In some people, it might be that their heart was missing a beat, but was going along at a normal rate. Um, and it's it's a condition that lots of you may have had in the past at some point. Sometimes you've had too much coffee, uh, a few espressos before you go to bed at night. You're lying in bed. It's all nice and quiet. You can feel your heart beating. And we, we're not normally aware of our heart beating. Same as breathing. We're not normally aware of our heart, of our, our own breathing, but we can become aware of it. Um, and that can be a cause of palpitation, just an awareness of your heart where you're not normally aware of it. So it means a lot to a lot of people. It's very important to understand what people mean by palpitations. Really common, some numbers here, 300,000 um, UK ED presentations a year. One of the commonest things that comes to present to GP land. And you can see a couple of years ago, when we last had some data, it was the 10th most common presenting condition to our emergency department. So a common problem. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we manage these patients when we first see them. So we're going to take a history. We're going to ask about password history and drug history. Um, and we are going to ask about uh, drug use as well. There are some drugs that can cause palpitations, you know, uppers, um, cocaine, amphetamines, things like that. But the key bit of the history is going to be what the patient means by their palpitations. And I've touched on this a little bit, but we're going to ask about the rate. We're going to ask about the rhythm itself. So we'll get the patient to tap it out. So just get them to tap on the table. So how did they, how did they feel the rhythm was? Um, did they feel that they were missing any beats every so often? Or did they have a sensation of getting extra beats? How long did they last? So it may have been a few seconds. And that's really reassuring if they last for seconds. It may have been half an hour. And that's obviously a bit more concerning. So we want to know uh, how long they last and how often they're getting them. So again, if you're getting you know, 10 to 20 um, a day and they're only lasting a few seconds each, these are not likely to be worrying palpitations. If you get one a week and they're lasting for half an hour to an hour, then they're more likely to be a cardiac cause for our palpitations. So we're going to be a little bit more cautious about those. We want to know, has a patient got any adverse clinical features with them? So anything that means the heart is, um, is under stress while you're having the palpitations. So 
Um, is it affecting the perfusion of their heart? Have they got chest pain with it? Are they feeling lightheaded? Are they feeling pre syncopal like they're going to pass out? And then also we're just going to think about any symptoms that might indicate an underlying problem. So, for example, um, hypothyroidism can cause uh, a sinus tachycardia. So if patients got other signs, you know, have they obvious got signs of thyroid eye disease? They're having intolerance to the heat, for example. We might think ah, maybe they've got um, a thyroid toxicosis and that's the cause. Now, focused examination. Um, we're going to certainly listen to the uh, cardiovascular system. We're going to auscultate the heart, listening for any murmurs. Going to have a quick listen to the base of the chest to see if they've got any heart failure with this. And then we're going to just look for a few things that might indicate an underlying cause. So we've got a temperature of 39, there's shortness of shortness of breath, they're coughing up mucky sputum, they've been rubbish, been lying in bed for the last few days. Their tachycardia is going to be a sinus tachycardia related to, um, to a fever. So are these type of things that are going to give us an idea if there's an underlying cause. We're also going to go on and do some investigations. We're going to do a 12 EDCG. And uh, in the emergency department, we're going to take some baseline bloods. And they probably are useful in this circumstances. Again, we're going to be looking for um, uh, signs of thyroid dysfunction. We're going to be checking a, a full blood count. So people are very anemic. You know, if they've got a, a hemoglobin of 50 or 60, then they're going to have a sinus tachycardia because of anemia. And then we're going to think about what the underlying cause is. So obviously the whole thing about uh, palpitations is if we're able to capture an ECG while the patient is having their palpitations, then it's easy because we can look at the ECG, we can work out what the ECG is doing, and we can decide whether it's a cardiac cause or not. Most of the time when we see patients in the pre-hospital setting, they've phoned the ambulance, time you've arrived, the palpitations have stopped. Same in the ED and the ECG is normal sinus rhythm. So these are the some of the causes. And the ones in the middle in green here are the ones that we might be able to rule out pre-hospital or in the emergency department. And some of these causes, for example, the drugs or toxic causes, um, systemic causes and the non-arrhythmic causes are things we might want to do a slightly more focused exam and uh, detailed history on that we should be able to pick up. Um, but the really difficult ones is when we're not sure whether the patient may have had a cardiac cause for their palpitations. The ECG is now normal, but while they were having them, did they have one of these arrhythmias? Um, or could this be, um, could it be anxiety? Could it be an increased awareness of the feeling of our heart, our, their heart beating, but the heart's actually got a normal rhythm with it? So I'm going to focus for the rest of the talk on the two groups at the side and specifically the cardiac causes, because the ones they're the ones that we're really interested in um, and ruling out a, a cardiac cause. So let's assume that we have an ECG diagnosis in the ED. So I'm going to talk about that for a little bit um, to try and work out what we're going to how we're going to treat the patient. So these are a little bit easier, obviously, because we've got an ECG. So this is patient two, uh, onset of palpitations, and this is our ECG. So this will be familiar to lots of you. <laughs> now, how are we going to approach this type of patient? So the things we need to answer, we're going to look at our um, resuscitation council, ALS adult tachycardia algorithm, and we're going to ask, first of all, are there any life-threatening features? The patient's got signs of shock. Have they had a syncope episode? Have they lost consciousness with this? Have they got chest pain and signs of myocardial ischemia on the ECG? And have they got signs of heart failure? They've got crackles up to the mid zones in the chest. Um, and they've got a tachycardia. We're going to go on and give them a synchronized DC shock. We must remember that this is a synchronized shock. So we press the sync button to make sure that we don't get any R on T, which can precipitate uh, any ventricular arrhythmias. So that's the first thing. Now, most of these patients who have palpitations don't have any life-threatening features. Um, patients who present with syncope are more likely to have more worrying uh, arrhythmias, such as you know complete um, heart block, long pauses, ventricular tachycardia, um, and they are more likely to present with life-threatening features. But patients with palpitations, the underlying rhythms 
don't be one tend to be ones that that cause these type of uh, um, uh, life threatening features. Unless the patient may be elderly, they may have pre existing heart disease, and if you have, for example, an SVT on top of some fairly severe heart failure, that might be enough to precipitate cardiac shock. So first of all, we're going to ask, are there life-threatening features? If there aren't, we're going to ask, is this a broad or a narrow complex tachycardia? And if we go back to our uh, previous patient, we can define whether it's broad or long by the width of the QRS complex. So that's, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but this is obviously our QRS complex, and this looks like a narrow complex rather than a broad complex. So this is a narrow complex tachycardia. And finally, we're going to ask, is it regular or is it irregular? And going back to our patient, we can see that um, all of the QRS complexes are separated equally as we go through the rhythm strip. So this is a regular um, narrow complex tachycardia. And a good way to do this, as I'm sure uh, a lot of you will know, is that we can check and um, we can trace out the QRS and then we just move our piece of paper along to see whether all of the complexes tie in when we move our piece of paper along. So that's essentially the, the uh, Resuscitation Council guidelines. We're going to look at it narrow, broad, and then if it's regular, irregular. And that will give us an idea about what the underlying cause is and what the treatment is. So moving on, we are looking at someone here who's got a narrow complex tachycardia. Now, let's have a chat about narrow complex tachycardias. Now, narrow complex means that the uh, that it's um, a arrhythmia or a rhythm that's been generated above the ventricles, because anything that's been generated from the ventricles will always be a broad complex. And our options here are either that it's a narrow complex tachycardia that is coming from um, above the atrial ventricular node. You remember that your electrical rhythm is generated at the SA, sinoatrial node. It comes across the atrium, it gets to the atrial ventricular node, and then it runs down through the atrial ventricular node into your bundle of hiss and into the ventricular system. Now, Anything originating above that is going to be independent of the AV node, and this could be a sinus tachycardia, could be an atrial flutter or an atrial fibrillation, which has been generated within the atria. It could be an atrial tachycardia, and this is where you've got a, a small piece of myocardium, an ectopic focus of myocardium that's generating a tachycardia. So there are AV node independent, and then we've got the AV node dependent um, tachycardias. Um, now, there are two main types, and this is um, the AVNRTs. This is an AV nodal reentry tachycardia, and you've got your ARVT, which is your atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. Essentially, um, and simplistically, the ARN, the AVNRT is being generated in the node itself and is going round and round in the node. The AVRT is going between the atria and the ventricles. So we have an accessory pathway somewhere between the atrial ventricles that are normally separated from each other. Um, they don't normally pass electrical current between them. But at some point between the atrial, ventricular, the atrial and the ventricles, there's this ectopic pathway that allows the conduction of electricity. Normally, the only conduction between the atria, the atria and the ventricles goes through the AV node. But in some patients, they have this little pathway that's an accessory pathway. And an AVRT is when this goes round and round through the, uh, the node and back up through the accessory pathway or the other way around. And that's when we talk about an orthodromic and an antidromic. So essentially, you've got your AV node independent generated above the AV node, which have uh, atrial tachycardia and flutter and uh, atrial fibrillation. And within the node itself, where the nodes important in it are the AVNRT, which is just within the node, and the AVRTs. So this is just an example of what I was talking about with the AVRT. So you can see that this is the AV node where the electrical current normally passes. 
but there's this little accessory pathway that would normally in most people be blocked off but the electroactivity can come back up through the atrium and then go back down through the AV node. And it goes round and round and round, generating this uh, circular circuit, which then causes the heart to beat very quickly. And it can be orthodromic, which is when it goes down through the AV node, or antidromic, when it goes back up through the AV node. And I'll touch on why that is relevant in a little bit. So back to our patient, we've decided they have got a narrow complex tachycardia. They don't have any adverse features. We don't need, need to uh, give them a synchronized DC shock. We've decided that uh, it's narrow complex and it's regular. So the most likelihood is this is going to be some type of AVRT or an AVNRT. So what are our options for this? So we've said we don't need to immediately DC cardiovert them. So we can think about this type of patient giving some vagal maneuvers to. And we used to do this by getting the patient to breathe out for a few seconds and then to relax or to blow into a syringe. There was a trial about five, six years ago now called the revert trial, which showed that using the revert technique, which was a modified Valsalva, we could um, massively increase the number of patients that can be cardioverted using vagal maneuvers. And I think my next slide is a slide um, of Andy Applebaum, who's the chief investigator on this, um, taking you through how to do the revert technique. I'm Andy Applebaum. I'm uh, the chief investigator for the revert study. Um, and I'm also a consultant at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital in the southwest of England. Hello then. Um, I see from your heart tracing that you've got a condition called SVT. Is that so the REVERT trial was a randomised controlled trial to look at a method of modifying the Valsalva manoeuvre for the treatment of SVT. We um, asked you just to get a good seal around that with your mouth and blow hard enough to make the needle reach. The modification was designed to increase venous return during the relaxation phase of the manoeuvre and involved laying the patient flat and lifting the legs in the air at the end of the strain phase. Well done. Overall, uh, we found that patients that were randomised to the standard manoeuvre, only 17% of patients were cardioverted to sinus rhythm, whereas for the modified technique, 43% of patients well, so uh, returned to sinus well. rhythm. Really well. It really does demonstrate marked improvement with, uh, with the modified technique. Uh, and I think we should consider using that as a standard approach to the to the initial treatment yeah, of this condition. Five, four, three, two, one. And just completely relax. Lift your legs up in the air. So okay. we, we used a, a right. blood pressure manometer that was modified for the trial, and, and that can be done in emergency departments. But uh, in other practice or usual practice, uh, a 10 mil syringe blown just hard enough to start moving the plunger, okay. uh, we believe gives a, a similar sort of pressure. Right. So you ready? Mm -hmm. And ready, steady, blow. And the, the benefit of that is that patients can uh, use this at, at home and outside of the hospital because it's a condition that can recur. Um, and that gives the patient some control um, and may mean that patients don't need to come to hospital in the first place. OK, and we'll see you back up now. So there you go. So very effective. And um, I would advocate that we do that as the vagal manoeuvre for all patients that we're wanting to try and uh, cardiovert uh, an SVT using uh, vagal maneuvers. Now, let's say we try that and it doesn't work. And you'll know, you'll all know lots of patients who may have had a previous SVT before who said, oh, I've tried the revert or I've tried blowing a syringe or I've tried squatting down. They've, they've all got techniques to try and get their heart to, to cardiovert itself. And we'll see patients that hasn't worked. I will always try this myself in the emergency department because um, you, if you know how to do the technique um, and you do it exactly as Andy was demonstrating there, uh, you do find that it's it's it is extremely successful and you can save the patient drugs. So um, even if they had a few goes pre hospital, I will do it myself and it, it, it might well work. But we've decided that it hasn't. So we're going to need to think about drugs and what drugs we're going to use. Well, there's two, really. The one you all know about is adenosine. So this is a um a drug that uh, specifically acts on the AV node. And the idea is that it pauses activity at the AV node. It's half life, it's so only about 10 seconds, so it doesn't last very long. And then it resets this electrical circuit. 
we start with six milligrams, we can go to 12, and you go to 18 uh, if that's not worked, um, or you can repeat the 12 again. Um, and the idea is that you reset uh, the rhythm. Now, the really important thing about adenosine, or there's two really important things. One is that it has to be given quickly. So we put a large cannula into the anticubital fossa with a large flush in the bottom of the cannula, and through the top of it, you give you adenosine. So the adenosine goes in, you flow out a big flush. Some people say you should lift the arm up as well to try and get all of the adenosine to the AV node all at the same time as quick as possible. Now, the patients, the second thing about it is the patients you mustn't give it to. So anybody who uh, is on something that will potentiate the action of the adenosine at the AV node. So this is something that... Um, instead of it just lasting 12, 10 to 12 seconds, it's gonna last a few minutes. So a colleague of mine once gave it to somebody who was on dipyridamol, which prolongs the action of adenosine, and they had a, a couple of minutes of asystole and had to have a bit of CPR. They did very well, but um, that's why you need to ask about dipyridamol. Anyone who's got a cardiac transplant, because they'll have different innovation to the heart. But the one we're likely to come across more commonly is someone who's got asthma. And the reason for that is adenosine can cause bronchoconstriction, which we then don't really want someone who's got an SVT and also has got uh, marked asthma exacerbation at the same time. And in those patients, I'd go for something like verapamil, um, which if you've not used it before, is very easy to use. It's five milligrams to start with. It, it works over a few minutes. Um, and it's not quite as impressively acting as adenosine, but it, it does tend to convert um, you give it over two minutes and it, it does tend to convert within about two to 10 minutes, but that's an option if someone is asthmatic. So that's our drug treatment. We gave this patient um, some adenosine and this is their underlying heart rhythm. Now, when we get a normally, or when we get an ECG, when the patient is no longer in SVT, we have to look specifically for one condition that may have caused an SVT. And that is Wolf Parkinson White. So this is one of those um, accessory pathway conditions when there is an abnormal electrical conduction between the atrium and the ventricle, which sets up this orthodromic or antidromic pathway, which we have interrupted by giving the adenosine. And the way you can diagnose that on a normal ECG is that you get this upslope in your chest leads here so you see this upslope here as demonstrated here and the patient will have a short pr interval so nowadays our ecg machine will tell us what the pr interval is so have a look at that if it's less than 100 um, and you can see a delta wave then you've diagnosed wolf tarting parkinson white syndrome the reason we need to know it's a little bit that about that is that um it can because of um the accessory pathway you've got to be a bit careful if someone's got broad complex um, because you can precipitate ventricular fibrillation if they have atrial fib fibrillation, which I think I'm going to touch on. So that's SVTs. We've covered the narrow complex regular tachycardia. We're now going to tackle the narrow complex irregular tachycardia. And these are going to be things like atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Now, I could talk for an hour about how to manage atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter and um, you could talk to lots of people about how to manage it and lots of people will tell you very different things. But I think the important things to take away are, firstly, is it primary or secondary? And what we mean by that is my heart is normally in sinus rhythm. If I have a pneumonia, my heart rate would increase to 140, for example, but will be regular. If I'm normally in atrial fibrillation, going along at a rate of about 80, if I have pneumonia, my heart rate will go to up to 140 and I'll be in atrial fibrillation. So I'll have fast atrial fibrillation. But the reason is because I'm generating a sinus tachycardia due to my febrile illness. So we're not going to treat that the same way that you wouldn't treat me if I had a pneumonia and a sinus tachycardia of 140. You wouldn't treat my sinus tachycardia the same way we wouldn't treat the person with atrial fibrillation who's going fast because of an underlying illness. So is it primary or secondary? Secondary, is it secondary to something else? Other common things um, that can cause atrial fibrillation will be anything that disturbs the, um, you know, the, the balance of the body. So things like um, people who drink have, have a heavy alcohol content, for example, it irritates the myocardium and it sets the myocardium off into atrial fibrillation. So can 
be difficult to convert until the patient's maybe 24 hours free of alcohol and then the heart will be less irritable and will settle back into a sinus rhythm. So that would probably be a secondary. Another reason why we might not treat it because we might not be able to treat it while that secondary condition is around. So is it primary? If it is primary, it's we're saying it's a cardiac atrial fibrillation. We want to know how long the patient has had it. If you're in atrial fibrillation, for more than 36 hours, there's a risk of a thrombus building up within the atria because they're not uh, pumping efficiently, they're fibrillating. So fibrillation, they're just doing this rather than efficient um, contractions. So you can build up a thrombus, which then if you restart the heart or get the heart back into sinus can be thrown off causing a stroke. So we only want to really cardiovert someone without giving them anticoagulation first if the onset is within 36 probably 48 hours. Then we want to decide if we're going to manage them, do we want to control the rate? So do we just want to slow the patient down? We'll commonly give something like beta blockers for this. Or do we want to control the rhythm? Do we want to try and flip them back into a sinus rhythm rather than atrial fibrillation? And if the onset is quite short, it's primary, they're young, we're going to try and do this. And we can do that either with drugs or by a uh, electrical synchronized DC cardioversion. So that's all I'm going to say about atrial fibrillation. Uh, moving on to patient three. So we've got a tachycardia. The heart rate is around about 130. The patient isn't shocked. This is a broad complex. So if you look at the QRS complex, it is broad. It's more than 120 milliseconds. So a broad complex tachycardia. What are the options? How are we going to manage it? So this could be the default position is this is a ventricular tachycardia, isn't it? What this could also be, we talk about SVT, but with aberrant conduction. So it's been generated in the atria or possibly in the AV node, but the patient has a bundle branch block, which is prolonging the complex. Now, the, um, the default here is to treat it the worst case scenario. So treat it as a ventricular tachycardia mentioning patients with um, Wolf Parkinson White. Now, if they have an antidromic, so the conduction is coming down through the uh, AV, uh, the atrial ventricular accessory pathway, and then back up through the AV node, what can happen is that adenosine interrupts that, but you can induce AF. Some of these patients might have AF already. What you end up is with this circuit then going around with AF, which then goes to the ventricles, causing ventricular fibrillation. So you're in a much worse state than you were. So a caution about giving adenosine to patients who you know have got Wolf Parkinson White or who have got broad complex tachycardia. So we may, if we think it's someone who knows and have a SVT, we may still try our vagal maneuvers, even if they've got Wolf Parkinson White, for example. But our default will be treating as if it's a VT. So the safest option is to go for a DC cardiac version. This is uh, the same patient, post cardiac version. Um, this patient didn't get denosine, even though it says post denosine. Um, and you can see the patient's got a broad complex underlying rhythm. So this was an SVT with a bundle branch block because they normally got a bundle branch block. So their SVT will also have a bundle branch block. So hopefully I've, I've managed to um, touch on a, a fairly simple algorithm for managing patients with a uh, palpitation where we have an ECG, where we can decide, have they got uh, need resuscitation and cardioversion? If not, is it narrow or broad? Is it regular or irregular? What about those patients like our patient PM who came in to start with, who we have no an ECG which is totally normal because all their palpitations have stopped. So what do we do with that type of patient? They could have had an underlying arrhythmia which has stopped. They've come into us. What do we do with them? The examination is normal. The history, they had a 20-minute episode of palpitations which they felt pretty rubbish with. They've not had them before. So this could still be a cardiac arrhythmia. And the, the two main types of cardiac arrhythmia we need to be worried about in this type of condition or this type of situation are SVTs. Um, so the, all the narrow complex tachycardias, the SVTs and the atrial fibrillations. 
Now, this may well be something like a uh, multiple uh, ectopic beats, so that would be very regular. It might be a cytosate arrhythmia, so this is in young, healthy people. You can, as they take breath in and out, the heart becomes faster and slower and faster and slower, and it can almost seem irregular. It's a very pronounced sinus arrhythmia. It's very unlikely, as I said before, with palpitations to be a ventricular arrhythmia. So as I said, we need to try and capture the a correlation between the ECG and the patient getting symptoms. And what we used to do with these patients is they used to get sent away to a clinic. You get seen at some point, they'll get a halt and monitor on one of those um, old fashioned sort of Walkmans. If you remember the Walkmans where you just have your headphones on and a little box, you just walk around listening to music. Well, the halt is the same type of thing, but it's recording your heart for 24 hours. The problem is 95% of patients don't have any arrhythmia during that time and we don't pick up with the causes. So they have multiple 24 hour tapes and we never managed to pick up the cause. So what we used to say was, well, when you get a palpitation, it's really vital that we capture it. So either phone an ambulance, come to us quick as possible to get an ECG um, or go to your GP if they had the ECG machines, but that's much less likely now that your GP surgery will have an ECG. So how do we capture this? So these people go years and years without a diagnosis. Um, what things might suggest it's cardiac versus a non-cardiac cause? Um, so there's a few things here. If they've got previous history of cardiac disease, if it came on at night, um, makes it more likely that it is an arrhythmia. If the male, if it's irregular, um, if it lasted for more than five minutes, they all are more likely to be associated with a cardiac cause. Uh, causes that are more likely to be associated with a non-cardiac cause are patients who've got a palpitation that lasts more, less than five minutes and those who've uh, got a lot going on, a lot of anxiety, very aware of their heartbeat um, and are getting multiple episodes, so like five or 10 episodes a day over the last couple of weeks, um, all suggest an awareness of their heart rather than palpitations secondary to a cardiac cause. So they're much more focused on their heartbeats much more aware of it, they notice it beating it, they're quite anxious, the heart beats a bit faster, they notice their heart's going fast. Um, and this can be quite a, a um, sort of perpetual um, thing until um, the underlying cause is explained that it's more likely that you've got an awareness of your heart racing rather than it being any heart problem and there isn't anything to worry about. And lots of the time that's that's enough to sort of break that, to break that chain. Now, I've got something here that we are now using much more commonly and will probably be something that you see a bit more in clinical practice. This is an Alive Core device. So it's a device which is quite small. Uh, you pair it with your phone. And as you can see, you can record an ECG while you are out and about. So you might know, be at the shops or something, you get some palpitations, you get your Alive Core Cardi device out of your pocket, you call an ECG. And it will tell you whether your what your underlying rhythm is while you're having an event. Now, this is the card device. You'll see probably an awful lot of people coming in with their Apple Watches. And I'm sure most of you have come across someone who's had a palpitation and has been able to capture on their Apple Watch. So we're seeing that increasingly now that people are coming in, having captured their rhythm, and we can actually interrogate the Apple Watch to see what's uh, see what that shows. Now, obviously. Not everyone's got an Apple Watch. So devices such as this, we could be using to try and capture these rhythms once someone's left the emergency department over the next couple of months. So we looked at this. Um, we randomized patients to either go away with one of these devices or to standard care. And um, we looked at 90 days to see at the end of that um, how they were doing. And we found that six times as many people who were given a device had um, had an event that they managed to capture with the device over the next three months. And these are the rhythms that people got. So this is actually also a really nice uh, graph showing the types of causes of palpitations. As you can see there, only about 15% are um, causes which are cardiac, <coughs> atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, SVTs only make up about 10 to 12 to 15% of everybody who presents to the ED with palpitations. 85% maybe even up to 88% of people have non-cardiac causes. These are ectopic beats. 
These are patients who've got sinus tachycardia, so normal, regular tachycardia. These are patients who've got um, sinus rhythm, but with uh, extra beats every so often. So we can reassure so many people who have palpitations and it's only that small wedge at the top who have cardiac causes. And you can see as well that those are not serious cardiac causes, SVTs, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. Yes, they're associated with stroke if you have them for a long time. SVTs are not pleasant if you're getting them very regularly, have a real impact on people's lives if you're getting them. And the patient PM who I spoke to at the big, about at the beginning um, got to the point where these were happening so frequently. She was having atrial tachycardia runs that she couldn't really get out of the house to walk the dog because they were having every week and she felt really awful with them. So um, not in any way um, lessening the, um, the lifestyle impact that these things have, but they're not ventricular arrhythmias. These people are not going to drop down, die of their ventricular um, tachycardias. We need to find out what the cause is, but we can reassure people that um, they are not life-threatening. We picked up causes much quicker using the device. We found more cardiac arrhythmias. So we found 11 people in the intervention group versus one in the control group we picked up. So there was still 10 people around, obviously, with a cardiac cause for their um, palpitations. We hadn't picked up through the control group just because they were getting regular 24-hour tapes and it wasn't picking it up. It's cheaper because people weren't coming back again. Patients are satisfied with it. And because of this, we've, we've set up in Edinburgh a smartphone palpitation service whereby the patients who come to the ED with palpitations, we send them away to come back to a next day clinic. They get fitted with a cardio device and they go away with it for the next uh, month to three months to see if they record any rhythms while they're using the, with the device to try and find out what the underlying cause is. There's a QR code there and it's got our, our uh, protocol on it. Um, so if any of you are interested in setting up uh, something locally, then um, you can scan that and you're more than welcome to pinch uh, our protocols. Um, so uh, that's been set up for five years now. In our first year, we had about 300 people through the clinic. And we picked up about 20 people who'd had a cardiac cause. And again, it's the common things, atrial fibrillation, SVT, flutter, atrial tachycardia. So these are all the things that cause palpitations. Um, and important to capture them, obviously atrial fibrillation requires treatment, SVTs, we can ablate people, we can start them on beta blockers. So there's treatment for these things. And for all those patients who get all these palpitations and record um, sinus tachycardia, sinus arrhythmia and ectopic beats, we can reassure them what it is they're feeling, talk them through what the heart's doing and reassure them that these are just the things that we don't need to worry about too much. So this is, a, this is something that I'm sure we'll see an awful lot more um, and are probably seeing a lot of already at the moment with people with their Fitbits. Uh, we've seen a lot of people come in from the gym with a Fitbit suddenly recording a rate of 200. Um, Apple Watches, which we'll call the rhythm. Um, and obviously not everyone can afford a um, uh, a... Uh, a phone, smartphone that will link with their live core device. But there's there's other things out there. This is the Yo Heart device, which doesn't require a phone to pair it to, um, which obviously provides a much better equity of care if the NHS are not going to provide these things. So we'll see an awful lot of this. They're all digital event recorders that allow us to pick up a rhythm while the patient's having their uh, palpitations. Um, you can get these on Amazon and through the BHF, I think. Um, and they've got six lead mo models now as well. Um, so, uh, and there'll be other companies that will produce similar type of things and like the OHART as well. So I think this is where we'll be going in the future with management of palpitations and probably we'll be seeing less of it in pre-hospital care and emergency departments because people will be able to go to the GP with their, uh, their rhythm having captured it themselves at home. So uh, that's the end of the talk. Um, a few things uh, just to take away. Uh, first of all, as I've just finished with there, that the um, prognosis for patients with palpitations is very good. The main cardiac causes that we're likely to find are fibrillation, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia, and SVTs, um, which is sort of an umbrella term for the AVNRTs and the AVRTs. Um, as well as the cardiac causes, which I've focused on, there are other causes, non-cardiac causes, which we've touched upon as well. Um, and we've also said that 
a lot of this certainly uh i think a lot of this around covid as well as people have been very much aware of their uh physiological function they're aware a bit more of the heart aware of the breathing and um, for whatever reason that is so we're seeing a lot of patients who uh, have this this um this reason for presenting with palpitations or awareness of their hearts it's just to be on the lookout to be aware of that whilst not missing obviously cardiac causes um, most people who've got an arrhythmia we need to find some way of correlating the uh, symptoms with an ECG and there's lots of ways of doing that um, and as I said there at the end most of these are low risk and GPs once the diagnosis is made can manage most of those and a few may need to be referred to cardiology fibrillation for example so that's it for me